Hey guys, I come with some great news. Today we're going to speak to an exited founder, someone who has had his company bought out by MasterCard. Yes, and he went through Y Combinator, and he went to Wharton, and he was an investment banker. But also, get this, he started from nowhere. So he wasn't the typical, you know, Wharton graduate. He wasn't the Ivy League kind of fit. He was from a Latin American background, grew up in the most horrific conditions in New York. No money, no support, no guidance. And yet this gentleman still did incredible things. And that's why I wanted to bring him onto my YouTube channel and also promote him in so many different ways because he has a book called The Underdog Founder, which I want you guys to instantly click the link and buy because you do need to read this book it is i'll give you a quick disclaimer this book is quite tough in terms of it's a reality check there is no like bits cut out he tells you the horrible side and the truth and the good side and he made a lot of money at the end which is great that's a happy ending but you know if you're a brand new founder thinking i want to be a startup look he gives you the reality of what it takes if you are currently a founder and you're in the middle of your journey, having the highs and lows, as every founder does, then this book is going to be very inspirational because it really does make you realize that, oh my God, he's probably gone through worse or whatever you're going through. Um, this is going to be that beacon of hope. So get that book. He's also on social media, LinkedIn. He's currently, he, he got his company sold uh, in 2021. This is him over there very friendly guy uh very nice he actually offers some mentorship and coaching so if you get a chance maybe do that too because if you are a startup and particularly if you're from a diverse background so this conversation i'm having with him is actually a lot more focused on whether you're a female or from a diverse background so of course if you're not this is still going to help you. So enjoy the video. Subscribe to my YouTube channel because if you do, I will do more of these kind of videos. I have incredible people in my network that I haven't showcased on my YouTube yet. But if you genuinely want to see more of this, give it a thumbs up. Give me some comments and feedback. And I would love to then go off your enthusiasm and do another interview. But in the meantime, let's get started. Let's meet Edrizio. I'm very excited to speak to you. And thank you so much for being here. Now, Huge question for those people who haven't read your book, but I'm going to force them to. What would you say made you be ambitious? Like you went through hell in your childhood or you could have ended up in a completely different place. How could you summarize why you ended up being the success that you are today? Well, Heather, first of all, thank you for having me. Uh, I'm a big follower of you. You may not know that. So so thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. I, I think that the single quality that I had uh, that I think that allowed me to progress. It definitely wasn't that I was definitely not smarter, you know, better network or better looking than anyone else. I, I felt like I had this capacity to turn uh, adversity, tragedy, obstacles into huge advantages. I just had this attitude that whatever happened to me, whatever negative things happened to me, I can use that as fuel to propel me, you know, from point A to point B. You know, I, I grew up very humbly, uh, and I, I, after college, I was able to get a, a decent job on Wall Street to pay well. But it really wasn't until I, you know, I sold the company. Look, like, up until I sold the company, I was, you know, I had, just had a baby, I was negotiating hospital bills, delaying them as much as possible. Up until like that one event happened, which totally dramatically changed my life forever. Um, and you know, the first feeling that I felt was immense amount of gratitude and relief. Uh, you know, I think I think money beyond happiness buys you freedom. Freedom to, to not having to not have to stress about you know certain decisions. Freedom to freedom to, to, to not work, which is which is great. You know, so I, I think the challenge uh for, for me, I think probably other founders is, you know, I've been working since I was 12 years old wow. so it's the first time in my life that i'm not actively uh yeah, hot. Working. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh i'm not actively working so it's, it's an odd feeling it's like getting used to that feeling um and also trying to figure out uh what drives me uh because you know i had this drive for the past decade you know so let's get in the company and then after it happened you know it's become more about kind of giving back uh, yeah. The book. yeah, I know. And honestly, like that's huge. Like that was an eye opener for me. I don't know any other founder that's written something that kind of hit 
like through truth bombs the way you did. And I absolutely mm -hmm. love it. I get a lot of people who are aspiring to be like you. They're aspiring to one day sell their company to MasterCard, you know, like, or be going to Y Combinator. Like lots of people say, I want to apply to YC. And you, against all odds, got in. Incredible story. What do you think is the characteristics of a successful founder? I think that there, there are several. Uh, and I'll go kind of in reverse order. I think uh, one of them is is, is focus. Uh, I, I think good founders are able to to focus and narrow in and kind of put blinders on, figuring out specific uh, problem uh, and trying to find a single solution to that problem. A lot of founders that I meet try to boil the ocean and try to be all things to all people. And, you know, Capucius says, uh, he who chases the rabbits catches none. Um, and, you know, I'll talk about that in the book. I actually dedicated an entire chapter to that. Um, another factor that I look for is, is kind of um, self-awareness or, or coachability. I think a good founder understands that uh, she is an orchestrator, that in an orchestra, you don't have to necessarily play the cello fantastically well or the violin fantastically well, but you need to... You need to get the person who's the best at the cello, and you need to let that person know when it's time to go through the ebbs and flows of, of, of the of the composition. And that's what a good founder does. He's a great orchestrator. He's a great pipe piper that can kind of attract great talent and kind of motivate, drive, and orient that talent towards uh, the right path. And, and I think the last factor is just an insurmountable amount of grit. That one I really, I use that a lot now in my head. I'm like, what's their grit quotient? I, I absolutely yes. love that. Um, and I mean, how do people get that? Yeah, I, 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 try, to, I try to figure out uh, what kind of obstacles people have faced uh, throughout their lives. And, and, you know, we all come from different walks of life and different paths. Um, and I feel like, you know, for, especially for underdog. I feel like we have the distinctive advantage of having gone through several more uh, layers of obstacles than other founders. And I kind of try to just tap into that, tap into that um, sense of kind of frustration, pain, sometimes despair, uh, not only professionally, but personally as well. Like, how, how do you feel that you've been kind of unseen and underservedly kind of mistreated? Uh, for X, Y, Z reasons, and try to kind of just tap into the core of that, right? Because that, that's feelings and energy, right? Yeah. That's all they are, right? Uh, how you choose to um, utilize that energy is completely up to you, right? You can use it for, for negative outcomes, like complaining on Twitter, <laughs> or you can use it for something positive, like like building a massive organization. Would you question whether your driving forces change now? Because now you've got a daughter. Would you would you agree that's one of your driving forces, right? you got a family. Yeah, it, it, yeah, no, it, it is. I think um, I also feel like immensely blessed to just to be in this position. I had to kind of pinch myself. I feel like the driving sport has has shifted now towards like being kind of someone that's a symbol of, of what others can do and, and trying to kind of relay that message and communicate that message at scale. I think is something that I try to do as much as possible. Would I feel responsible for, for that blessing. Oh, 100 percent. And and yeah, we're grateful. Everyone watching that will, needs an inspiration like you. Like who were your icons growing Early up? Early on, uh, I read a book called um, The Virgin Way by um, Richard Branson. Uh, yes. And I was, I was surprised to learn like about you know his struggles early on and you know how he had he was dyslexic, dropped out of high school, you know, built a business very early. And I kind of uh, you know, I, I had like a small business in Guayabas uh, when I was 12 years old. Uh, so I kind of um, nice. empathize with, with, with that. Uh, and I empathize with the struggles early on and really, and, and with the, you know, the, 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 the devil, the, you know, the daredevil um, kind of uh, attitude that he had. Um, I really appreciated that. But, you know, since then I've had several other people that I've looked up to for different reasons. You know, Barack Obama, I talk about that in the book. Absolutely. How he's able to uh, be diplomatic, yet you know, forceful. Uh, and I, I utilize him as, as kind of the ideal way of how founders of color should represent themselves. You know, yes. be a diplomatic, you know, keep your cool, but at the same time, highly confident. Would you like, for example, your daughter to see 
you in the future or other people? There's, there's one anecdote that I share often. Um, I, you know, in 2020, I talk about how you know, uh, my wife and I, we had, you know, kind of miscarriage. Uh, yes. I lost my grandmother, had COVID. Yeah. I got kicked out of my own company temporarily. And I was at a hospital one day, and then I come across this book um, called um, Meditations by Marcus Aurelius. And, you know, I was just falling through it, falling through it, falling through it. Uh, and I come across this quote that says, the impediment to action advances action. What stands in the way becomes the way. And in that one quote kind of helped me kind of just totally reframe where I was, uh, which is a very dark place. Uh, and and I just said to myself, like, oh, man, that's that's been my whole life. Like, I, I've always seen an obstacle. And just instead of turning back, I just kind of find a way around it. And, you know, I hope that, you know, what Marcus Aurelius was for me, I can be for other people. But there's a little bit of light when, you, when you're feeling down and out. Uh, Your book certainly gave that. Did you have imposter syndrome ever? A, a lot. I mean, I remember when I, you know, I had... Out of college, I had you know, I graduated much later than most folks at 25. I yeah. spent six years as an airplane mechanic, a blue collar worker. Yeah. And then I was kind of I had the opportunity to, to go into um, investment banking, which is probably the most white shoe yeah. environment that you can think of. So definitely didn't feel like as comfortable. Okay. Uh, this is definitely a particular culture, a particular way of carrying yourself in that environment. That you know the people that are there, they grew up with that. They grew up with yeah. you know, etiquette and protocol classes and they went to boarding school and they just had access to that from early on. I was just propelled into it. So I had to kind of learn on the go. Sometimes I, I made a fool of myself in front of other people. Um, but I, I really enjoyed that because I felt like, man, if I'm here, that degree of discomfort means I'm learning something. Oh my God, I wish everyone thought like you. Yeah. I certainly like this. I mean, I I, I love that because I'm someone who never gives up and I, I grew up with the guys. So that's why in a male dominated yeah. environment, I just felt like, yeah, this is normal for me. But other women or even other guys in a situation like you just described, going from, you know, a non-typical background into some very posh top, like in, investment banking background, mm -hmm. they would feel so much imposter syndrome that they would just say, oh, I'm not ready for that yet. Or I don't want to be part of that. That's the conversations I hear a lot of. Not many people say what you said, which is, you know, I like this, I'm growing. So what tips would you give to someone who has imposter syndrome right now? I would say imposter syndrome is, is a natural uh, emotion. Uh, I, would, I would, first of all, feel it, you know, internalize it. Uh, don't judge it. Um, and then think about the fact that it's actually a, a positive situation to be in. Because if you think about it, if you feel imposter syndrome when you, you're kind of, you feel like you're you're hitting above your weight class, so to speak. Yeah. yeah. That, that means that you're kind of outperforming your own expectations. That's great. That's an opportunity for you to observe and learn from others. And, and if you're there already, that means you're probably deserve it right probably deserve to be in that room with those other people okay that's, that's nice you're there. perfect reframe right. diverse background founders so what is the real i mean you can answer this more than anyone else what is the real adversity they're facing when they're pitching for capital they go to a venture mm -hmm. fund they go and pitch you've had competitions left right and center tell me the real insider information that no one else is talking about it took me a while to discover the layers behind this but I think the best way I could describe it is, is, is a simple fact of the fact that, uh, look, a lot of these venture capitalists uh, invest based on a pattern. Yep. Um, and that pattern historically is topically, you know, typically uh, male dominated, typically um, you know, white male dominated. You know, think about, you know, the Mark Zuckerberg stereotype, you know, the, yeah. the, the, the 20 year old, you know, uh, Harvard dropout engineer. So they, they, take to, they, they tend to over-index on that pattern because it's been successful for them. So whenever they get a pitch, the first thing is that they say to themselves, that the investor says, does this person fit the pattern? And unfortunately, that does a major disservice to people, you know, to women founders and to uh, black and brown founders as well. Um, so, so fighting the pattern, uh, it's kind of the, the number one, I think, obstacle that you face. Um, and when I, what I talk about in the book, principally in chapter two, 
uh, in being the chief is, is like the fact that you, you have to be twice as good as the next person just to get ahead. Uh, you have to be you know, early, you have to be twice as sharp, twice as prepared. Uh, you have to communicate with clarity. You have to kind of talk about your, you have to kind of humble brag a little bit, which sucks, but you have to, you know, you know, talk about your accolades, your accomplishments. You know, you know, if you went to a good school, talk about that. If, if you accomplished something very early on, talk about that in a very kind of um, polite way. So the other person understands and has a, a good sense of why they should take a chance on you over the other person. Uh, it's not fair. Uh, I didn't make the rules. But uh, those are things that I've learned over time can uh, put you in a place of success. It will change. And I honestly personally think that it will change by, for example, fund managers being different, right? This is why I'm pushing you and anyone who's watching, I'm secretly asking Idrisio to open his own fund or work with me, which would be even better. Um, because I think having people like you as a fund manager, you you dictate where the capital allocation goes, not just giving it away like a yeah. charity, like you said, it mm -hmm. has to be a great company, but you will make the other diverse founders feel comfortable to kind of stand up because they were like, oh, he's, you know, he's kind of showing us it can be done. Just like the four minute mile, the first time that was run. Yes. Impossible, right? And and after that same year, as soon as that happened, the whole neuroscience of what was possible, the realms of possibility changed in our brains and people running it left, right and center. But before that, yeah. people died, apparently, you know, or there was so much scrutiny over that four minute mile. So in the same argument, that same thesis is what I believe fund managers should be doing. Like, we don't want to rely on uh, you know, the standard fund manager to allocate for a diverse fund that the stats will not change because people kind of relate to each other in, in a different way. So um, well, let's talk about the downside. What is the downside? So imagine you were a fund manager. What would you kind of be looking out for? Red flags in a diverse background founder because you know that maybe their relationship. For me, for example, I would think, okay, can they really handle, do they really think big enough because they haven't had someone in their in their history ever do this what would you be looking at red flags in a diverse founder that you've given them the first allocation and then you're like mm -hmm. okay let's see what they're made of how good can they get i feel that one of the red flags that i that i i see not only diverse founders but i think all founders is typically um they assume they have all the answers uh, which is kind of a slippery slope because you need to have a high degree of conviction and you need to be almost delusional to, to become a good founder because it's so hard. Uh, but there's a sense of cognitive dissonance there where you need to be delusional, but also grounded at the same time. <laughs> you have to be able to hold these two opposite kind of driving forces at the same time in your head. Uh, and the reason you need to be grounded is because you need to be able to look for answers. You need to be able to look for, for guides, for coaches uh, all around you. Uh, you know, whether it's uh, how to build a company to, you know, how to build a financial model, how to build a station, you know, how to iterate on the product. You're constantly looking for answers externally um, because other people have done it for you already. So I, I think a, a good founder is one that can proactively uh, seek out help from others and keep evolving relationships because none of us have the answers right like you know entrepreneurship is unlike other career trajectories where you know you go to school for it here it's kind of unscripted unstructured so you have to kind of create that structure for you yeah agree i call that word coachable you know that i love that the way you said it so yes and and it's part of my investment thesis actually that this is why i would really want to either have them in a incubator or accelerator program or somewhere where or a mentorship even where mm -hmm. they actually have to pay for some sort of and then that becomes part of my deal flow because until someone's coachable like they're not worth investing in because you're like oh right i'm dealing mm -hmm. with someone who just thinks they know it all it's like a speaking to a brick wall you can't change or pivot when needed so uh mm -hmm. thank you for kind of adding validation to that thesis in my head too but everybody listening to this it's so important to get a coach and actually you're offering your coaching as well how is that going it's going really well very well. I, I typically like to coach uh, young founders who um, have a very clear idea, uh, who have a, a team of a technical founder and a, a business founder, but don't quite know how to formulate it. Um, that's typically where I like to come in. When you already have 
kind of uh, an idea and it's already developed, so it's a little tougher for me to add real value. Typically, I like to go either at idea stage or pre-idea stage. Wow. So you, are you dealing with someone who's already a serial entrepreneur or brand new, someone who's in a corporate trying to create an idea? Like, which one are you dealing with? Or, or? Be, believe it or not, believe it or not, both. Uh, I've actually had uh, quite a lot of luck working with, like, second-time founders. Nice. Who, sometimes, I, I think humans, we just like to have a sounding board sometimes. Just, just Sometimes we just want to hear things and confirm from another party that it is, that's the right way forward. So to my surprise, I've worked with several second-time founders, like quite a few. Okay. Okay. So all serial entrepreneurs obviously are going to be a lot higher probability of creating success. But first-time mm -hmm. founders, I've always found that they struggle with just not having a paycheck, which is an interesting concept for them to kind of get away from. Um, I struggle with first-time founders. I put them into a mentorship first to show that can you create traction? If they're pre-revenue, gosh, like that, that's a bigger risk to me. Now, when I'm dealing with women, I have got, and I want to ask your opinion here. I, for example, I had coached a male and a female, exactly the same peak performance coaching. I am a peak performance coach to many executive individuals, whether they're business owners or tier one bank executives. And in one case, a female, I took from 18,000 a month, we got it to 200K a month in a year and a half. The same coaching, a guy, he got, he was doing 5 million a year. Yes, I know it's a little bit more to start with, but he then did 15 million in five months. Wow. You know, and mm -hmm. the trajectory is this is the same coaching, the same stuff. And the difference I saw was that she versus him, his relationship with money, men tend to have this like, who wants to be a billionaire? Hands up, male. Mm -hmm. uh, women, uh, no, I think that's like a bit crude. Uh, you know, this is the conversation they go in the head. I don't need to be a billionaire. I don't need money. I just want to be happy. You know, and I'm not saying everyone needs to be a billionaire, but I have a problem with the way women don't mm -hmm. want as much in terms of wealth, money buys you power, power to then have freedom, freedom, then make your the right choices, and you'll be happy. So I don't think it just makes you happy. You know, this yourself, you, yeah. it will just give you the freedom to do, to do what you like. And that's power in a way. So it's power yes. to do or not do something, you know, and that's really, really important. So I make sure people know this at the very beginning, that money is just a tool, you give it its own meaning. But the more you have, the better choices you can make for you, yourself, your family, your health will become better because you can actually look after yourself more, you know? Um, so why, what do you think is the issue between why women don't want as much? Um, even if you look at the stats, you know, it's not, it's not me. It's like, why is the richest person on earth never, has it never been a female? Um, has implemented this thought and ethos um, into, you know, who's the breadwinner of the house and who's the caretaker of the house. And, and, you know, some of it is also biological because, you know, women are in charge of, you know, creating yeah, yeah. humans, <laughs> creating humans, which is kind of a big deal. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I think those two aspects are important to, to note. Uh, but having said that, I, I feel like, you know, in many cases, I mean, this is not me, this is research. I mean, in many cases, it's quite well known that women make better leaders uh, because they're more intuitive and more empathetic than, than men. Yeah. Uh, it's just a matter of kind of creating a funnel uh, and instilling very early on, uh, you know, going back to the conversation, you know, about my daughter, like, you know, it's about like being comfortable, like making decisions and being comfortable with being wrong, being comfortable with being an outcast. Like that's part of being a leader. Uh, and that those are kind of things that I try to instill into my own daughter very early on. And hopefully this next generation feels a little more comfortable and hopefully we can make leaps and bounds in terms of the numbers of, you know, Fortune 500 CEOs that are, that are women. Absolutely. And this is exactly why what you're doing on social media is so important. And also this is the only reason I post on social media. Honestly, I hate it. Otherwise, um, I would not be doing it for anything other than the purpose of, you know, trying to be the change I want to see in the world. So please keep doing what you're doing because these kind of messages is again, validation for other, both men and women, you know, any background, they just want to hear that they should just keep pushing, keep going. And for women in particular to that statement of why they don't want as much, you're right. The background, the history, they've had a low back, you know, poor start as such, 
But now the world has really changed. And I do think in the next 20 years, there'll be some major changes at that top level. Hopefully. Hopefully. Yeah, you know. And would you actually want your daughter to be part of that kind of realm? Would you want her to pursue wealth in the way you have? I don't think I will push any agenda. Uh, I think I, I would definitely support uh, her, but also guide her into what's available. I think I had a lot of support growing up from my parents. I didn't have guidance, which is different. Guidance is providing knowledge uh, in terms of access. Like, like you can do this. Like, no one told me I should go to college or why I should go to college or why I should be an entrepreneur. Uh, I, I feel like, especially, you know, for about, you know, 10, 11 years of my life, my life was aviation. That's all I knew. Wow. And Yeah. no one told me I should explore other venues, other, you know. So I feel like he's providing guidance, uh, not only to kids, but to founders as well. Yeah. Like, hey, you can also do this, by the way. There's all, Yeah. like, think about that. Let us roll your head a little bit. I've got a hypothetical question. So imagine you were a fund manager and you wanted to make the best returns in a five-year period. So what types of businesses would you look to invest in? I'm biased because, uh, I mean, I, I know fintech uh, and I know Well, fintech's uh, B2B, a bit yeah, B2B enterprise. Uh, so that's kind of like my lane that I've played in. And, you know, personally, I, I, I tell this upon this all the time is, you know, uh, your biggest chance of success is, is kind of working with um, key insights. And key insights only come from personal or professional experiences. Okay. So like, so if you work in logistics for 10 years, you're probably going to have a key insight logistics. better than I would, right? Um, so that, that's, so, you know, I, I like FinTech. I think it's, uh, I think it's an evolving space in the U.S. and Latin. I think it's still about to be broken. And I think with the advent of AI, um, I feel like there's a lot of things that could be changed. And I think AI is, is not even like a, a segment anymore. I think it's like table stakes. I think AI, if you're going to think about AI the way they thought about, you know, cloud computing like 50 years ago, like, Like Yeah. you're not gonna used to say like cloud base. Uh, now it's like it's assumed that you're in the cloud, Absolutely, uh, yeah. and so so and, and then after that was mobile, right? It's like Yeah. uh, mobile optimized or mobile first or mobile native. You know all these words. Now it's like whatever app you launch has to be mobile optimized. It's it's kind of like understood that that's the case. Same thing with AI. I think it's understood that whatever you do has to be AI power or AI you no know, adjacent. It's like this iteration of AI, it's so, it's now kind of available for mass adoption and mass market. So I think what investors are trying to do right now is like, oh, like we've seen this story before. We saw it with mobile, we saw it with, you know, internet 1.0. It's like something's going to happen here massively. They just kind of, pray, you know, you know, spray and pray, so to speak. And that's what they're doing. Okay, so in, if you were so in this hypothetical scenario, you're a fund manager, your investment thesis would be B2B fintech. Would you just stick to that one sector? Imagine it's a hundred million fund, not a major one, but to get good alpha on a fund, you want to stick to like a small allocation. That's kind of how I've taken my approach. So you're not doing a billion dollar fund, you're just going for the hundred million because if you allocate it in the right places, the returns would be better for investors. But would you put all of that into that B2B section? Or would Uh, you be to I, say? I, I, I don't, I, me personally, I, I, we try B2C, I, I talk about it in the book, I fell miserably. Yes. Yeah. I, you kind of have to be a tastemaker to be B2C and understand what, like, where trends are going. I mean, Yeah. you definitely are a tastemaker. I am not, <laughs> uh, you need to understand, like, you know, have that sense of what people are kind of, Consumer. you know, trending towards to. Yeah. Um, that's something that just, that's just not a knack that I had, uh, kind of, kind of learned that, uh, through awakening. I think B2B enterprise is that I understand a lot better now, like selling to enterprise, understand how to make decisions, how big corporations make decisions, uh, and say the sell cycle. Um, I feel like I can help a founder much better than, um, not only in fintech, but, you know, any AI product. appreciate it. My investment thesis is B2B to C and B2C only because I feel, and I'd like your opinion on this, I feel that the next generation of major, you know, founders will always have a social media platform. There will always be some sort of influencer now. And I think that's the quickest way for me to see how investable someone is, is how much pulling power have they got, you know, 
my generation is optional, but if you're 20, 30, like if you haven't got social media and if you've got a, if you're a founder and you haven't got social media and you're not talking about your services, I think there's a major problem there. Yeah. But I think that that's now for me, the biggest platform I see, they're already creating their own community, their own economy. Uh, investing into them is just a, you know, scalable, you know, that's it. What do you think about yeah. founders being on social? I think that's a good observation. I, I think social media for this next generation is going to be kind of um, something that that's part of your your identity. It's, it should be, if you're a founder, like you need to be out there talking about your business. You need to be out there and kind of becoming a thought leader. And I think it's going to become. I think that's. I think it's going to become essential to be yeah. a thought leader in, in whatever type of startup you have, because no matter who you're catering to, whether it's consumers or businesses, th those consumers, I mean, those customers need to hear from you to understand what you do and why you do it better than anyone else. Yeah, absolutely. And you were pitching and closing without, you know, social media being in a major part of your, like you weren't doing what you're doing today. For example, when you were pitching for Arcus, um, you know, so your OG style of closing, I absolutely <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Because that's a rarity. Reverse, go back however many years when you were first pitching the big money. Imagine you had a massive social media platform and people could see that you are, you know, influencer in your own right. Would it not make your pitching easier, like giving that positioning? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I think any venue that allows you to practice uh, communication in a clear, concise manner is one that will train you for a better fundraising presentations. Yeah. Uh, I never thought about it that way when I was in the middle of, of, of building a company. Uh, but now that I got a chance to do a little bit more of, of these, you know, speaking engagements and you know, uh, social media reels, where, which is a forcing function for communicating something very important in a very kind of short time frame. Yeah. It's definitely a great skill set to have. Yeah, absolutely. So what are your OG tips for pitching? Like what if someone is going to pitch to a fund? I absolutely think, will you please write a book on how to close? Because uh, you obviously have some sort of magic. Honestly, you I was one thing I was noticing in the book is like he's completely underplayed how good he is at closing. Like, oh, thank you. like a lot of people struggle with this. Um, but there is something that you're doing. So let's summarize like three points. Like, what would you say is three major points that would help someone right now raise even 10 million for their venture? So I, I think one of those, um, I think we'll go back to, to like the top of the conversation it is, is focus. I think when you're communicating what you're saying, it needs to be very focused. You need to be clear in terms of, you know, what problem you are solving, who you're solving it for, and why you are better at solving that problem than anybody else that's talking about that problem. So kind of answering those three questions out of the gate, Love it. I think I think it's very important. Um, I think I think clarity is also very important. Uh, a lot of uh, founders uh, use jargon too much, and what I discovered is that the best founders use uh, layman's language, uh, everyday language, yes. to communicate very complex subjects. Yeah. Um, remember, investors can't and will not invest in things that they don't understand. Uh, and if you're worried whether or not you're being kind of uh, impressive enough like you're impressive by how clearly you can communicate your idea and the problem you're solving to investors and that's the best way to impress some people i love that uh, um and the last the last one probably the most important one is, is you have got to be you have to come off with somebody that's maniacally obsessed with this idea right you have to be almost delusional you have like you got to be unstoppable right you need to be this this individual who will not flinch at the sign of failure at the sign of an obstacle when you make a mistake you need to really come off across as a person that you're ready to kind of walk through many walls for, for the next decade right because that's what on average it takes to build a successful tech company right so you just kind of those three aspects, you know, focus, clarity, and just up, you know, obsessive compulsion. I, I think those are things that I, I think to uh, like look for in a founder when they're when they're presenting. 
I love it. Honestly, those points are gold. So if anyone watching this, re-watch, write that down because honestly, that part was fantastic. I mean, honestly, you should write that book because I would be the first one to buy it. Are you writing any other books, by the way, on, on anything? Because that was uh, good just to be one. <laughs> I'll, I'm thinking about it. I'm thinking about it. I'm thinking about like different aspects that I can like, pour into a book. But right now, I'm just kind of like, kind of committing the messages to the masses right now. Okay. When it comes to founders, do you prefer that they bootstrap or just start from, like a lot of founders come to me and say, oh, I've got this idea. I want to raise something, but they've never even tried to get post revenue with a, uh, maybe like, for example, all my companies, I bootstrap. So I, I took companies from zero to making lots of money. And the way I did it was I used to find sponsors that were non-conflicting and they wanted the same customers, customers as me. So if I wanted to pay for this really ridiculous, you know, if I needed the money to start something up instead of, I never got into debts. I never got, I never took any loans out. Um, I just got, I, I was a closer. I managed to get these big firms, even Bentley, Lamborghinis and whatever to pay for whatever I wanted to do, because I would convince them, rightly so, that the client base that I could attract would be also valuable to them, but in a non-conflicting way. I struggle when I see founders who can't think like that. So what is your opinion to have you even tried to get post revenue by bootstrapping or finding a co-sponsor versus raising from zero? I, I love that approach. I feel like we, especially in this day and age where you know we're in the middle of a recession, where uh, venture capital is uh, a lot more scarce than it was a few years ago. Um, there's countless number of, of stories, even tech companies that have been bootstrapped and people just don't know about. I think we need to hear more about it. I think people need to understand that venture capital is just a path towards scale, not the only path. And I feel like you can still accomplish all the same success by bootstrapping, um, even if it takes a little bit uh, longer and it's a different path. Uh, and I think the one that you articulated, it's, it's great. I, I hope you write about that because I, I want to learn about it. Like I would definitely, yeah. okay. <laughs> I definitely would, would be the first one to like learn about it because that's a kind of a world where I don't know as well. Okay. Um, so that, that's, yeah. that's so, fascinating I, to me personally. I have got so many ways, like I've been doing this kind of thing since 2004, but no, I'm, I honestly think that post revenue should be a prerequisite. I mean, unless you're doing some biotech, which I don't invest in because I just think it's too much R and D and it just is a waste of money. In my opinion, I don't think I could get, I'm not an expert at that. So for me, I deal with founders that literally, if your problem as in, if you're fixing a problem that makes sense to the world, you know, like you're making the average human being wealthier, fitter, healthier in any way, uh, Anything that helps serve, for example, one of the companies that I'm looking at investing or is part of my deal flow is a, it's like a Panda doc and chat GPT, very simple concept, right? Imagine those two like merge. So a small business owner that wants to do an M&A contract that can't afford legal fees or it just wants to build through acquisitions, but doesn't want to pay tons of legal to get these fancy contracts made and they don't look competitive enough without it. So this would be a simple, very affordable, very cheap piece of tech that would help them get to that point. That's something I really like. I look at them as my investment thesis is aligned to this founder. He is an influencer. He is someone who doesn't mind being in the limelight. Um, he's already proven he's got a customer base. Scaling him up would just mean putting the experts in. And I think someone like you would also be very useful to some to someone like that because they don't have they, they just know how to be an influencer they don't know how to do kind of be that real professional mm -hmm. polished version that one day mastercard would look at or whoever would look at and say yeah we want to buy that so yeah your value is huge in um for stuff for the startup world and i hope you do write more books and i hope you do more things mm -hmm. let's fast forward to one of the last kind of questions which is what Imagine the day of our death, like your death this time. Sorry for being a bit morbid, but I feel like this yeah. creates a lot of perspective. What would you, imagine people come to your funeral. What do you want them to say about you? Uh, hopefully I can be perceived as someone that helped people dramatically change their relationship with, with obstacles, their relationship with, with tragedy, their relationships with, you know, whatever challenges they had in life and, and shift them away from being kind of this nuisance, this 
kind of block to something that you know help propel them forward, right? That that's what the book is about. You know, that's you know the, the, the tennis of stoicism. Yeah, reframe that that chip in your brain uh, uh, of using something that's uh, a break, something you know, that's fuel. Um, so that's that's kind of what I would hope that people think of me. That I go out because of you know Edrisha, like I, I think about these things a lot, definitely. Like, thank you, man. Yeah, you know, that, that's all I'm trying to do. You know, I love that. So that the answer for that to reverse engineering, and I really want you to achieve that, and you already will have because people have been uh, mm. reading your book and seeing you on social media. That means you can't stop social media ever, which is great. People like you are very valuable. So I just want to say thank you for, for doing what thank you do. Thank you, Heather. Yeah. Thank Pre you so much, Heather. Appreciate no, it. No worries. For anyone watching, please look at the link where you can find Adrizio. You know, as a minimum, I think everyone should read this book, which I have been talking about a lot. So at least knowing that someone like that is around to help you, that, yeah. that you won't have to give up on my side. Thank you, Heather. It's been awesome. <laughs> Thank you so much. Well, there you have it, guys. I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. I had so many questions, but I wanted to make it not just about women, even though that's like my personal obsession. Uh, but I wanted to make it equal for both men, women, and all backgrounds to watch. As you can see, the, the angle was very much about diverse founders because that's what Idrisio is actually uh, working on. He's helping founders from that kind of background to step up their game. And I love that. You know, I want to see more people get funded, whether you work with Idrisio, whether you work with me, I am super happy wherever you go just get funded get do bigger things you know you can't just bootstrap all your life and if you do you'll never get to your full potential and your net worth won't change you know so i'm really excited about this um read the book the link's there incredible book and hopefully he writes more books i really am encouraging him to do that one on pitching because i think he's really good if you read the book you'll know what i mean anyhow subscribe to my channel if you do subscribe then i will be encouraged to do more of these kind of videos so give me some comments below on what you thought about this video and i thank you all for watching see you guys in another one